You don't need to be more intellectually gifted than this guy to understand already from a first glance that some languages share the same origin. If you see that the English sentence I drink milk is Ich trinke Milch in German, Ich drink Melk in Dutch and Jij drinke Melk in Norwegian bookmol, you can see similarities are way too obvious to believe it's just a coincidence. And you are right. All of these languages come from the same source. But what if you hear your friend Mehmet from Turkey saying Süt içerim, which means the same thing, but you can see any resemblance between this sentence and the English I drink milk. Then you infer that the two languages have a completely different origin. And once again, you are right. English and Turkish don't come from the same language. But there's also a third possibility. What if you compare the English sentence with the Italian version Bevo il latte or the modern Greek one Pino Gala? The first impression is these languages are totally different from one another. So you'd say they have nothing in common. But in this case you are wrong. A couple of centuries ago some smart people who had nothing better to do but spending their days learning and comparing languages realized that most European and even some Asian languages shared some specific regularities. Mehmet, stop smoking and go home please! They took the most conservative words like numbers or kinship terms and they saw for example that English father is somehow related to Latin pater, Greek pater or Sanskrit pitar. Or take the word for three, which is tres in Latin, tres in Greek and tri in Russian. So they concluded that all of these languages were part of an ancient large family which they decided to call Indo-European or Indo-Germanic. Exactly, Indo-European, because it included languages stretching from India to Europe. But the thing is that most of the first linguists came from Germanic countries, like Germany or Denmark. And they were so proud of their discoveries that they decided to use such a self-referential word. And that's why we have the word Indo-Germanic as well. Well, actually, the official explanation was that Indic languages and Germanic languages were the two geographic extremes and their names could be symbolically used to define the whole family. But, no guys, we don't believe you. You just wanted to use the name of your people to feel cool. Come on, be honest. But the proto-language from which all of these languages had origin is unknown. Nobody used to write documents at that time that is probably between 5 and 10,000 years ago. I also tried to ask my grandpa, but no, he told me he hadn't been born yet. He said maybe I should ask Liz. But this is not the point. Today we know there was a group of tribes speaking some dialects which would be the starting point for most European and some Asian languages. These people, we don't even know where they used to live, maybe here, or here, or here, they decided to spread towards all directions, reaching places like Western Europe, the Mediterranean islands and India. As these groups drifted away from each other, their languages started becoming more and more different. And they couldn't even understand each other anymore. Something like this. I'm saying that a number of parliamentary colleagues who have disabilities do find it quite difficult getting around certain parts of the state. Given that we're doing this refurbishment work, what can be done to make sure that those with a disability are able to move around more freely and the place is accessible? Please, could you do it very slowly and then oh, in no. English? Some of these people settled in Southern Europe, starting speaking a language that would later develop into Latin. Other fellows slowly transformed their language into new ones, which would be the basis for the Greek language. Other Indo-Europeans settled in Asia and started writing holy books in their language, which is Sanskrit. Among all of these wanderers, there were also the Germanic peoples, the fathers of languages like today's English, German, Dutch, Swedish, Icelandic, and so on. Who is a friend of mine from Korea. I take this opportunity to say hello to her. Hi, Sawan. Hello! And this is the subject of this course, Germanic Linguistics. My name is Fabio, I'm from Puglia, Italy, and I'd like to welcome you to this journey. Let's go! Let's go! We're going to Ibiza! <sighs> Where the f*** did I end up? When the Germanic people started speaking their own language, they were most probably living in Northern Europe. 
We can't be sure where exactly, but most of the scientists who study the toponymy of the area around Denmark saw that 100% of rivers, lakes, woods had a name that included a root of Germanic origin. The names of the places are the most conservative words. They change more rarely than you change your socks. For this reason, they can help us understand where specific languages were spoken thousands of years ago. You could have asked me! No, dear Rexy, you were dead already. And such a thing is not to be found anywhere else. It was a period when there were no written texts, like the ones that we have today. There must have been a couple of linguistic signs showing that these tribes were starting speaking a new, different language. For example, they transformed completely the consonant patterns in a mechanism that we call today first consonant shift. Or sometimes using the German expression Erste Lautverschiebung! Yeah, you've got to scream it aggressively, otherwise Germans won't understand. Vowels changed as well. For example, they started mixing up two sounds, A and O. Another thing they did was creating a double usage of adjectives, with different endings, depending on whether the adjective referred to a definite noun or not. Which means, if they talked about something already mentioned before, or that the speakers already knew, they used some dissonances. If the noun appeared for the first time and didn't refer to a specific something or someone well known by the speakers, then they had to use other endings. We can say that in one way the Germanic people simplified the Indo-European grammar. But on the other hand, they introduced more complex structures, like the one we mentioned. We are people. But the real revolution in their language came when they switched from a mobile accent to a fixed accent, which means they started concentrating most of their speaking energy on those syllables bearing the meaning of the word, subtracting energy from the grammatical or morphological syllables, like dissonances or pronouns or prepositions. It might seem not so important, but this phenomenon changed everything. From the single sounds to the way they used to build sentences. Like a chain reaction. But why did all of this happen? Well, it's hard to say. You know, languages are constantly subject to variations. Coming from the inside, like the tendency to use as less energy as possible, or from the outside, like the imitation of languages people are in contact with, or new socio-economic conditions. Some scholars believe these new features of the Proto-Germanic language come from the influence of non-Indo-European peoples who inhabited the same area where the Germanic peoples decided to settle. That's what we call substrate languages, which means that these languages disappeared and the few things we know about them come from the traces they left in the documented languages. But we cannot be sure about the origin of this phenomena. We can have fun with our imagination as much as we want, but for the moment, there's no definitive answer. One of the aims of this course is to try to understand how this Proto-Germanic language sounded like. Today we only have hypothetical reconstructed roots, and they look kind of weird but still not as weird as the Indo-European ones, that you wouldn't be able to distinguish from Wi-Fi passwords. We will also try to understand how this language evolved into today's Germanic languages, through the Middle Ages, when monks started translating religious texts into their languages, until today, a period when Germanic languages are spoken all over the world, not only thanks to the influence of the English language, but also because other languages belonging to the same group were exported to other continents. Think about Afrikaans or Pennsylvania German. Okay, so this was just a little introduction. I'll wait for you for the next lesson. We're going to list all of the Germanic languages and say a few words about them. If you are interested in this course, a great idea would be to click on subscribe and also on the bell icon in order to receive a notification every time I upload a new video. A slobbery kiss from Fabio. See you, stay tuned and behave yourselves.